Hello everybody, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. My name's Phil Alexander and I'm the coordinator of these conversations on Zoom. Um, today we have Max Stern in conversation with Alex Klein and I'm just going to introduce them both and then hand over to Alex to lead the discussion. Max Stern is a composer, performer, conductor, musicologist, music critic and educator. He is a pioneer figure in Israel's musical life and has created a rich genre of biblical compositions blending East and West with contemporary idioms and genres. His works have been performed at leading festivals in Europe, Asia, the USA and Israel and released on 19 CDs. He's founding professor emeritus of music at Ariel University. He's lectured widely at international seminars and conferences. Besides newspaper criticism and journal articles, he is the author of an introduction to the theory of music entitled The Speech of the Angels and two monumental volumes on the influence of the Bible on Western music entitled Bible and Music and Psalms and Music. And Dr. Sturm won the Israel Composers League Lieberson Prize in 1990. His co-discussant today, Alex Klein, was born in London. Alex has been passionate about Jewish music, especially Chazanut, all his life. As a youth, he took services in Finchley Synagogue and studies at, studied at Jews College. He settled in Manchester, where he brought significant Jewish artists and cantors for concerts to the UK. And he worked with Geraldine Auerbach, director of the Jewish Music Institute and friend to many of us, as head of its synagogue music section. Together, they created the European Cantors Association in 2012, which runs cantors conventions in European and British cities and many other programs. Alex and Max, welcome. Thank you very much, Phil, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, it's an honor to speak and listen to Max Stern, who I've admired for many, many, many years. Um, how this came about is quite interesting. Uh, Max is a neighbor of my niece, Rivka, and um, they went to a, a launch of his new CD and Rivka phoned me up and said, wow, I've just met Max Stern and he's got a fantastic CD out. Do you know him? And I said, yes, I do. He, I admire his work and tremendous. He said, how do I get hold of him? So she said, I'll give you his phone number. We had a chat and the result of um, that meeting and that chat was we have a program today with Max Stern. So welcome, Max. And uh, I've got to thank Rivka for this introduction. And I'd like to hand everything over to you and you can do your presentation and we're all eager to hear what your presentation. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome. It's unmuted now. You can you can hear me. Yes, it's OK. Yeah. All right. Let me just give a, a little bit of background to, to the whole idea of what I'm doing. The Bible was the magnet which drew me to Israel. It was the promise of God to Abraham. Unto your seed I will give this land. When I was reading it in New York, it suddenly struck me, we are this seed and the promise is our promise. And this was my vision in coming to Israel over 40 years ago. Walking in its light, I found inspiration, giving musical voice to biblical text, narrative, and landscape, intro integrating the rich musical worlds of European and Near Eastern Jewish traditions with the abstractions and innovations of contemporary classical music. And this was my way of contributing to the regeneration of the land with an artistic component attuned to our time and place. The first work that I'd like to present is influenced by the shofar, the biblical instrument, Yovel. The Bible tells us that in the 50th year, you shall make proclamation with the blast of the horn. U karatem dror baretz, proclaim liberty throughout the land to all the inhabitants thereof. 
the composition Yovel takes its character and tone from this passage. The following clip was broadcast by Israel Television, preceding its premiere performance in the Negev by the Israel Sinfonietta under Uri Meir. Some years later, I conducted it myself with the National Symphony Orchestra of Thailand at the Asia Composers League Festival in Bangkok. I was surprised then to discover that Far Eastern musicians, so unlike ourselves, were able to grasp its spirit and message. Encountering the young players outside the concert hall after the performance, I asked them, how were you able to connect to a work so different from your own experience? I will not forget their sincere and heartwarming reply. I guess it's because of the universal language of music, they said. So with that, Phil, let's hear a little bit of it. Hello, Max, it's Phyllis. Hi, Phyllis. The old flute player. Wonderful. So glad to be invited, and it's wonderful Hello. to see you. Thank you, thank you. Are we going to hear that, Phil? Yeah, I'm just finding the uh, just finding the clip. Sorry, my apologies. I had it lined up and it's disappeared now. <laughs> you have it. This is a this is a, an interview, and then you'll see me conducting the the ending of the work with the with the um, orchestra in Thailand. My apologies, it's disappeared. Shall, shall we get it on another version? No, it'll it'll come. Don't worry, I'll get it for you. One second. Get it. This uh, this work also was the first work on the CD, but the performance on the on the CD is uh, was done in Beersheba, and it's uh, it's a better performance, I think. Let's see. Okay, it should be good now. מקס שטרן עלה לישראל מארצות הברית לפני 22 שנה. יצירותיו מעוררות עניין בכל העולם. באמצעות שימוש בחומרים בני זמננו, הוא יוצר ז'אנר חדש של מוזיקה קלאסית מודרנית. נגנים בתזמורת אמרו לי, אתה הכנסת רוח חדש, אנחנו לא ידענו איך להתייחס ליצירה. לקח להם שלוש חזרות. שלשנות את הראש. על יצירתו החדשה יובל, שאותה הלחין לכבוד יובל המדינה, חצי יובל הסינפונייטה ויובל לשחרור באר שבע, הוא אומר. אני לקחתי מהרעיונות שלי, מהרגש שלי, לא לקחתי מלחין אחר. ועל פי ההשראה של, ה... של היובל, על פי ההשראה של שופר, על פי האווירה שאני מרגיש כאן בנגב. הסימפונייטה תבצע את היצירה במסגרת הסדרה קלאסיקל הזיקה היהודית בניצוחו של אורי מאיר ואכן המוטיבים ביצירה קשורים ליהדות ולישראליות דוגמת השופרות. וזה הכלי מתכת הם עושים זה כל בכל היצירה אתה שומע טרמבון עושה טק 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 שטרן כבר עובד על היצירה הבאה שלו, אופרה, שגם בה תשתקף הישראליות. אני כותב את הקו הווקאלי. זה אופרה מאוד ישראלי, אני משתמש הרבה נושאים של מוזיקה עממית. היצירות האלה שהוא מלחין, אומר שטרן, הן מודרניות וקרובות יותר לדור הצעיר. האם בזכות יצירותיו התמלאו עולמות הקונצרטים בדור הפירסינג? לא בטוח. שטרן חושב אחרת. הנוער, הם יכולו להתייחס. זה נותן, זה נותן לי תקווה.
that that was our first step. Now I'd like to speak about inspiration from the landscape of Israel, a work called Bedouin Impressions. From 1980 to 1986, our family lived in Yerucham, a development town in the Negev. At the edge of the desert, through the window of our living room, I saw Bedouin herdsmen and herdswomen each morning and evening coming and going with their flocks of sheep, goats, and camels. One afternoon, I took my three-year-old daughter for a walk in the wadi behind our house. We followed along the dry, meandering river path when suddenly we came upon two Bedouin women sitting on a rock with their donkey. They were as startled to see us as we were to see them. Neither of us knew what to say nor what to expect of the other. As a gesture of goodwill, my little daughter gave them a waffle, and they in turn reciprocated by offering her a ride on their donkey. Inspired from this simple human encounter, devoid of politics or ideology, the composition Goat Dance was born. It conjures up images of a little goat frolicking in the desert. The performance we will hear is by the Kinneret Quartet, which took place during a conference devoted to Israeli music at Ben-Gurion University of the Negev. Well, next work, are we ready? Can I speak? Yep. Okay, the next work is an example of inspiration from prophecy and vision. Ha'azinu, the song of Moses, is Moses' farewell address to the children of Israel. Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. Ha'azinu ha'shamayim vedabera. It was originally written for contrabass and orchestra and premiered in 1992 by the Jerusalem Symphony Orchestra 
with renowned contrabassist Gary Carr as soloist. A few years later, upon request from a husband and wife, harp and organ duo, whom I had met in Essen, Germany, at an International Society for Contemporary Music Festival in 1995, I adapted the orchestration for harp, organ, and contrabass, and performed it myself with them on a tour of 10 German cities a year later in 1996. The contrabass takes on the role of the lawgiver, exhorting, reproving, and justifying the ways of God to man, while the harp and organ represent the eternal witnesses of heaven and earth. Let's hear. Next work is something that was inspired by history and biblical narrative from Sam Book of Samuel, Prophet or King, and it was written for my students at Ben Gurion University of the Negev. Prophet and King deals with, the, of course, the issue of Saul making asking that uh, if he should be a king to to Shmuel. It was inspired by my students' unruly behavior in class, and it integrates past and present, a rebellion from ancient Israel with the contemporary, the contemporary spirit of mass protest and demonstration. It was written as a vehicle for channeling my students' educational resistance towards creative ends, and its message is simply that spiritual leadership alone is not enough for the masses. Even though after coronation, the king will cynically take advantage of the people, the people nonetheless reject the prophetic voice. It was a problem then and remains so to this day. Phil, can I ask a question about your music before you carry on? Uh, Max, I mean. Yes. Yeah. Um, when you go through your uh, presentations to an orchestra or to the conductor, maybe you're not conduct you're there yourself or conducting, do you have to explain the theory behind the music itself and, and what brought it to its conclusion? for the conductor to interpret on the musicians how you particularly want it to play as opposed to just reading the notes yeah i i tried to i tried to um explain to them 
and um, sometimes they they're interested, and sometimes they're not. It's not so simple. The conductor sometimes are just interested in the nuts and bolts of music, and the 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 philosophy and the spirit. It depends on the conductor. Uri Meir was very sympathetic, and, and, and but there are others who who are are more technical in their approach. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Then you see, you see just you see an excerpt of that. Okay, the uh, the last work I'd like to present in, in this uh, before I bring some other things is inspiration from the Creator and the creation, the Reishit, the creation of the world, the beginning of the book of Genesis. It gives voice to biblical narrative from the perspective of an angel beholding God in the act of creation. Jerusalem Post critic Uri Epstein characterized the work as an expression of exhilaration and awe in witnessing the phenomenon of creation. This video, presented by the Ashdod Chamber Orchestra under Louis Gorelick and soloists Amalia Yitzchak and Avihai Ornoy, is an excerpt from the premiere performance before an audience at Kibbutz Yavne. It's here, it's the end of the work.
Well, these works presented by professionals and amateurs, both here and abroad, testify to the ever continuing power of the Bible as a living source of inspiration for contemporary Israeli music and culture. Kumi Uri Kiba Orech, arise, shine, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Let's hear a little bit of the Bedouin impressions now by the uh, Israel Sinfonietta. Can we hear that little little clip? <clears throat> That's that's one one that's one part of the program. If th there are any questions now, I'll answer them, and then I'll go on with some more material. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Yeah. There's a question in the chat from Ellie Devrin. Are your works directed by non-Jewish people? Very interesting. Well, um, very interesting. I didn't. I didn't. You know. I didn't think of it. We did. You know. On the on the international festivals, yes. But um, on the in other things, uh, now that I think of it, not so much. Not so much. Although although I I have some I have some recordings that we did in Boston. We were a whole group of non-Jewish people. We have yes, I do. Yeah, we had some Chinese and Koreans playing it, and some. Uh, some Americans playing it, yeah. The people, people have played it, yeah. Not necessarily Jewish, but because I live here and most of my work is with people around in Israel, uh, so it just happens that way. I think this comes out that way. Shall we go? Would you like to hear a little bit of the disc? Let's hear. Shall we hear? I, yeah, let's go on. Let's go on to the disc. But I mean, you might, you're inspired all the time to create and create and create. When something comes into you, what you do is something. You're traveling on a bus or in the car, and something something comes into your mind that you say, "I've got to put it down." It's an inspiration or a, a connection to something um, I want to start to work on. Um, do you get your inspirations that way, or do you have to think about them, or is it is it just by chance and then you work on things? How do you get your inspirations? It's not by chance. It's not by chance. It's uh, you you conceive of something and then you work it out. You work on it and you develop it and you improve it. It's not. It's not. Um, you know. It's not that you wake up one morning and say, "I have to write this down," or, or it comes to me on the bus. It's a, it's a it's a process. You you but some but you get an idea. You want to do something. You want to write a piece. I mean, a couple of months ago during the the pand pandemic, I uh, I had the idea to set the um, Nishma Kol High prayer to music. So I I started working on it and uh, little by little developed it. And we recorded that here in the, during the pandemic, right towards the end of the pandemic. Something I felt I wanted to, to, you know, to give some hope that I during that whole period. Can you tell us a, a bit of a background of the of the CD that you are going to present some of the works to? How did the the, the, 
The works on the CD are, XR, are pieces that have been written over the past 40 years. And um, they were things I can, I, can just, I can just go through a couple of them, and then you'll see exactly what, what I'm talking about. Why don't we start? Phil, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so let's do, do you have the CD, the, the excerpts from the CD? Yeah, I do. So let's start. Let's start. And, and the opening work is the Song of the Morning Stars. And this was a work that I wrote in Beersheba for the Beersheba Sinfonietta when I was a member of that orchestra in 1979. And it was inspired by the Book of Job. Varan Yachad Kochavei Bokia Yariu Kol Bnei Elohim, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. This is what Job. This is what um, God says to Job when He says, "You know, He's answering him. We don't, I don't know what's going to be. What, you know, everything's in despair." And God says to him, "When, when were you there when the morning stars sang together?" And so I wanted to write a piece that would express that. And this is this is this is a this is an excerpt of it. You can hear the whole thing, but you'll hear some of it now.
Okay. I see we have a comment from Phyllis Aronson. Maybe she wants to say something. The actually the next work Phyllis is a is a flutist, and the next work is for flute that I'd like to say. Yeah, um, I just wanted to comment on the um, the answer that you gave about interpreting music and the performers sometimes not seeming to want to hear about it. So that was what that was about. Instead of taking it that they're not interested, I think sometimes there's an idea that the music itself has its own um, force that wants to be expressed and they they want to stay purely with the music and not hear too much about background. It's just the way some performers approach it. Mm-hmm. Not not that they're not interested in what you have to say, but the music is speaking to them directly. Mm-hmm. And, now and now I think, I think I'm going to so the next the next, the next work, work on the disc, disc I, think I think you played, played this film. Because, because this is this is, this is a work, work called Three Ancient Pieces. And it's for flute, and it was originally for flute and guitar. Sometimes it's played with flute and piano. And I, this is one of the pieces called Birdsong. And it was inspired from a line from Eliezer Khalil's Ninth of Av keynote, Ohali. Uh, he says, after the destruction of the temple, the divine presence was like a bird hovering lonely in space with no permanent resting place. And the music is, the melodic content is based on a Tunisian piyut that I used as a basis for the ideas that I I elaborated upon. So we could hear that now, we can hear that. This is from the disc. Thank you. 
Yeah. Now, this let me answer that question that was asked earlier about non-Jewish performers, if my music is played by non-Jewish performers. It just happens that the next work on that disc is a work called Hannah's Song of Praise, and it was premiered in Prague at the Festival of the Old Testament by Czech artists. And it sets the prayer of Hannah from the book of Samuel, and it gives expression to Hannah's awe and gratitude for the birth of her son after many years of infertility. It's performed by non-Jewish performers in a, a non-Jewish orchestra, and the soloist, Kristina Valushkova, uh, also. And it's all of them were Christians. And the text of the of Hannah's Song of Praise became the model for the Magnificat in the book of Luke. It's, it's almost the same, uh, pretty much the same text, just transposed a little bit. And Christina was a, a Christian, and I asked her, after many years of working with her, we did a number of recordings, I asked her why she agreed to perform this work and how did she get to sing it in Hebrew? That's an interesting question. A non-Jewish person doesn't know the language is singing it in Hebrew, a language that's unknown to her. And she said something very interesting after working with her maybe four or five years. She said, I thought by singing it, I could have a child. That's what she said to me. And it's interesting that a year or so after this performance, she did give birth to a child. And so her faith was vindicated. So this is the power of the Bible, the power of the faith of people. So let's hear a little bit of that. Thank you. 
Yeah. All right. Are there any questions so far? Shall we can what shall we go on? There's a few questions in the chat. Shall I shall I read them? There's some interesting Ella is, is asking if you leave a lot of instructions as to for your performers. Are you are you a kind of are you a very hands-on composer or are you someone who lets the performers uh, go their own way? You know, you know for the composer, contemporary composer, we the, we we most of the time we we are involved in the in the, with the performer themselves it's not like uh, you know it's not like beethoven where it's performed all over the world and published and everybody gets you know everybody plays in every music school in the world so they write everything it's written in with the notation and there's instruction given but i can't say that uh, that the interpretation is um, obvious because there are many things that are not obvious in when you interpret music that um, you just have to work you have to work with them if if they know you and they're sort of used to you so you can um, you can sort of approximate it but always um, there's a lot of subtleties in notation you can you know there, there's there's two schools of notation really there's the kind of Boulez contemporary con notation where you say well i'm going to write every every little uh nuance in a, a a in some kind of rhythmic notation or phrase and then it becomes very complicated to hold the note a little bit longer to hold a little bit less to rush a bit or you can do it in the older way where they they would write the notes fairly squarely and then you expect the performer to um to add the rubato themselves so that um, the, the notes are a guide to what you're doing. Just like, if, for example, if you're singing an opera by Verdi, um, he writes the notes, he writes everything quite clearly, but the expression is, is the interpretation of the performer themselves. They will stretch a phrase, they will bring out a few notes, they will bring, you know, they'll expand upon something, take a lot more breath at certain places, and that's their interpretation. And um, my feeling is it's more important that the music is accessible to more people than that it's just um, mechanically or mathematically written in, in, in such a complicated way. So I would guess to say you have to explain it. You have to explain the subtleties for the music to come out. Just like if you're playing Bach, you play anything like that. It's, uh, you know, you play a quarter note, you play a half note, you play a sixteenth note, but one person brings it out and it sounds like Casals or or, or a great artist, and another person is like a student. It just they play the notes very mechanically. So, so that's just what it is. We just have to leave that uh, that space for the performer to fill in. Yeah. Thank you. Can I bring in Agnes, who has a question, has been waiting yes. patiently here? Um, I'm a little bit confused about the format because the questions keep coming in at sort of different places. So my question, I'm sorry if my question is in the wrong place, but my question mm -hmm. is that you started off with a piece about the Bedouins and you told us a moving story how you and your little daughter met some Bedouins mm -hmm. and and you played that music and then later on again you did something like Bedouin impressions or something like that so my question is um, did you ever work with any Bedouin musicians and um, I assume that there must be Bedouin musicians. You are an ethnomusicologist, so I'm trying to probe this aspect of of your connections with Bedouins. I I never worked with a Bedouin musician. Everything that's why I called it the Bedouin impressions. It's not based on Bedouin music in the least. It's just my impression of the Bedouin. You know, living in the Negev looking and seeing them, seeing the camels, seeing the goats, 
seeing them walk across the desert. And uh, it's a, um, how would I put it? It's a kind of a romantic um, image of, of the Bedouin. It's not realistic. It's, uh, you know, the, the imagery. Some, you see, this was originally a piece for solo violin. And I had three, three, three episodes. One was called uh, Pastoral in the Negev. One was called Lament, the cry of the Bedouin. And then the third part was what you heard, the goat dance. So it was just uh, my impression of the Bedouin, not, nothing more. It was not a musicological study or anything like and, that. And just very quickly, um, you are an ethnomusicologist as well as everything else. Um, have you come across music by Bedouins? And I've is there any? <laughs> of course, there must be music by Bedouins, but I've never researched it. It's not, it was never, you know, just wasn't my, was my interest. But there is music, I'm sure. I'm sure, you can find, I'm sure. Every group okay. has music. All Let right, me go then. on. Shall we go on? Yeah, thank you. This, okay. The next work is called Balam and the Ass. It's for trombone and percussion. And this piece expresses the journey that Balam took across the desert to Balak and Parashat Balak from the Book of Numbers. It's written for, for in modern, quite modern notation. And a piece like this I had to explain to the performers. Uh, one was a one, the, both of them were from the Israel Philharmonic, uh, Philip um, Stuart Taylor, trombonist, and Gene Cipriani, percussionist. It was written for a contest. The contest was by the Israel Composers League, and the idea was to write a piece for a trombone and percussion. And uh, I had thought about this for a couple of years somehow. It, it came to my mind. If I thought this might be a nice idea for a piece. But only when we had the, 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 the competition did I actually start writing it. And um, it was the rules of the competition are that it be, rec be submitted anonymously and it should be judged anonymously. And that's what it was. And surprisingly, it won the competition. And subsequently, this work was selected by the Institute for the Advancement of Social Integration in the Schools at Bar Ilan University for presentation in public schools and public school worship workshops throughout the country to expose Israeli children to modern music. So Let's start, we'll just hear the beginning, oh, beginning of the piece. And Balaam rose in the morning and saddled his ass. Vayakam Balaam baboker v'yachavoshetam atono. And the angel of the Lord placed himself in the way, and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with his staff. That's as much as we'll hear of this work. Let's, let's hear something of Balaam and the ass. It's a more abstract work now. It's more modern. Am I playing the entire clip that's on this? Uh, yeah, play on... the entire clip. It's, it's, yeah. it's not too much. Sure.
Balam, that's some of Balam the ass. So, what do we, what shall, what would you like? How long shall we go on now? Would you like to hear something longer, or something different? Yes, it's no problem at all. I think we're all fascinated by um, your music and and the, and the and the talk about it. So, yeah, I think everybody. Is, is staying and wants to hear more. All right. I, you want I do, it? anyway. All right. I, I I have a number of things, but I just, I just, I don't want to, yeah, I just, I have something that I planned. This is the story of the flood of Noah. Noah. The flood, the story of the flood. And it's a work, also, an, it's an aleatoric, slightly aleatoric work for seven saxophones. I chose seven saxophones because... Um, the seven colors of the rainbow, and I called it rainbow. And and um, so this is this is this was played was played by a famous saxophonist, Roger Greenberg, who became the head of the Saxophone Association of the, of the International Saxophone Association. At this time, he was just a a, a teacher in the in the north. Uh, North Colorado State University. Uh, if I put this on, will, will this? I don't. Should, do I need to share the screen? If I put this on, I just put this on. Can you see it? No. Do you see it? No. Or not. You don't see it. What is it you're trying to show us? I have a. I have a, a piece called Rainbow. Oh, I, I have that here. I can play that. I can play that for us. You have it. I believe so. So it's a YouTube one, isn't it? I have it. It's on the YouTube, yeah, but it's it's not with the it's the it's the one that's not with the players. It's the one with the pictures. Do you have yeah. that? You have I it. Believe, I think I do. Shall I play it, and you can tell me if it's the right one? All right. Let's see what it looks like. Okay. Here we go. Yes, that's it. Okay. Here we are then. Two will see a little bit of this.
that that's a complete work. We saw from the beginning to end. Any are there any very, questions? That was very, very actually very, very moving and the and the, the pictures it actually enhanced the music and yeah. uh, I was I was transfixed watching everything and listening. So all your senses are there with that music. So it brought out all the senses of the piece itself, the animals, the, the capturing of the with the rainbow coming at the end. So yeah, it's it just had me mesmerized. Thank you. Or right, is there any any questions? I noticed some questions there. Should we? Should you want to? Should we answer them and then and then? Ed, Isabel, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, I'll just read it. How much is notated and how much is improvised by the performer? And all the notes are written. All the notes are written. What's, okay. what's, what's improvised? <clears throat> it's in. It's it's within a, ryth a rhythmic. It's it's within a, a time frame, so the notes are all written. When they come in is written. Um, the entrances, it's all within like a, 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 a time frame. Oh, you had and, crackers. Uh, you had crackers. And but there are the the some of the passages that they repeat over and over are are free. They do that free. Uh huh. So I so that that's that's free. And but and the timing is not exactly notated. It's only notated within, let's say, a s couple of seconds within a bar. There are bar lines, but the bar is not a, a um, metric bar. It's a, sort of like a time bar of a second or two seconds, three seconds, let's say. And then they, then they sort of come in as they go along. And, and of course, it's one saxophonist, so you recorded it layered. Yeah, yeah. We, I have another. There's another recording on the, on the internet with seven saxophones. Uh huh. But 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 this recording is a better one because. Uh, In any particular uh, order, was it? Oh, we better. recorded it from the top to the bottom. We started with the first sax. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. We had soprano sax and. and uh, Got it. Alto, tenor, baritone, bass. So we recorded one track after another. And my other question that had to do with the percussion trombone piece: How did yes. the Israeli children react to? Yeah, they liked it. The children liked it. It was very. They liked the idea of, of the of the the animal, the ass. A very interesting thing with that trombone piece was I played it when I was once I was once in South Africa, and uh, I played this for the for a group of blacks in South Africa, in Soweto, and they were mesmerized by the piece of the Valandia tone. At the end, the um, you know the uh, the Balam is is defeated by the ass because he he speaks back to him and then he sings. This is that was the end of the piece. It's we didn't get to it. It's about fifteen minutes, so I didn't want to play it all. But the, they were just uh, mesmerized and they liked so much. They identified very much with the piece with the ass because they felt that they were getting back at the at the master. You know the the the, the oppressor. And they liked the fact that the ass was, uh, you know, rising and speaking out. The children, the children also like. We used to do it in the classroom. We did it in classrooms for children. Yeah. So it went well. Geraldine wants to ask a question. Yes. I loved the um, the pictures with the sounds and i just wondered whether you've written music for films or television no i never had the opportunity to write something for films or television nobody ever asked me to write it and uh i didn't uh, i didn't pursue it so you that's should great. you should because i think the pictures you know you're very good with writing to pictures or putting pictures to your music and you know oh, try you. try try and develop it <laughs> It, you know, the pictures came later. The pictures were not. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't take the pictures and write music to the pictures. I tried to find pictures that expressed, that would give you know expression to the music, because as as music itself, it's it's not always easy 
to figure out what is the composer saying. You know, you hear these sounds in, in and where does the, you know, how the idea of the imagination, where you put it in, I felt it was um, helpful to, to interpret the, the sound, the music. Yeah. Well, clearly your music um, gave rise to, to the pictures. So, you know, obviously there's a lot of pictures in your music itself. Yeah, well, I'm trying, there is an imagery, there's an imagery there that I'm trying to project. Mm. Yeah. And that's also the interpretation. That's the, that's the, the what you request of the interpreter to, to project to the audience. Project. Okay, now Ella wanted to ask. Ella, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Okay, right. Um, one of the first questions was the um, the Bedouin music, yeah. and um, it, it sort of reminded me of Bartok. And then I, I wondered, um, um, would you say there's all these um, kind of traditional musics um, have certain things in common, uh, or or is it a coincidence? Uh, do you have uh, Hungarian roots, or, or did you study him? Uh, it's funny you ask. It's how do you, I don't know how did you get to that question? It's a very interesting question. I'll tell you why. Because um, I I studied the Kodai method in Hungary, and um, what it well, actually that was my that was what interested that brought me in a sense to Jewish music. Because I had grown up in America, where we have the melting pot and the, the, you know, many cultures. And when I went to Hungary, I saw a culture, a single culture. And then we studied the folk music of Hungary, studied, uh, you know, the, the, they were in Kodai and the whole thing. And um, this influenced me to, to dig deeper into the Jewish, into Jewish music when I got back to America. So it's very, I thought it's a very, uh, how do I put it, pers perspicacious, perspect, you know, inter ins insight you have. No, it's just, uh, it's my, my knowledge is all from the stomach. <laughs> yeah, no, it's interesting, you, you may have seen, I didn't, I had no intention of... Um, I used know, to play as a, as a violinist, I used to play some of these Bartok duos, and uh, uh -huh. yeah. It's interesting. They, so maybe that's part of the that was part of the the Hungarian influence in my my yeah. education. Yeah, that's right. So yeah. it, it, well, there was Hungary there. That's exactly right. Very perceptive, uh -huh. I thought. Yeah. But I th I think maybe traditional music ha does have something in in common everywhere. Oh, I don't know uh, dances and uh, although it, it did it did strike me as 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 Hungarian. Yes. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. 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 I did have another question, but I, yeah. I forgot now. Uh, no, I was going to write it. But, uh, should, we, should we have Malcolm's question in the meantime, Ella? While you yes, please. Yeah. Yours? Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, well, just it was uh, it's always a great pleasure to hear Max, Max your music. This one, uh, and to hear you speak about it, and um, I actually have a, a, a question because um, the last few the pieces that you just played, the examples, made me think that um, how different they were from the previous ones. And I was thinking about the range of your musical language, the, the sort of the eclect. You know, you, you are very versatile. But I was wondering uh, while I was listening to it that if the orchestral works that you conducted have a tend towards a certain type of use of a tonality and the smaller, let's say the, the ensemble, the trombone, the, the saxophones, the chamber groups have this more abstract quality, whether you are, how do you feel more comfortable? Or do, you, do, you, do you somehow respond to different ensemble media 
with different types of musical language. I mean, do you, for example, do you have any orchestral works which you would say are very abstract and sort of? Yes, I do, but I didn't that, play them. I didn't. Okay, I didn't, so it's nothing have, to do with the medium. Yeah, it's not. No, you know, I have some works. I, I haven't. I didn't select them for this. For this, uh, but I could. We could. We could see some of them. I have a work called Jacob and the Angel, for example. That's 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 a kind of it's a, abstract. And there's another work that that was that inspired the uh, uh, Balam the Ass. I didn't speak about it, which was Perik Shira, that I had written. I wrote Perik Shira many, you know, for children. I originally wrote it for children, for a small group of children. And then after I had written Balam and the Ass, um, I, had, I, I, I rewrote the Perik Shira for, for an orchestra. So... So it's it's about it's a long it's a work of over half an hour. So I could we could play some of it if you want to hear it, but you can find it on the internet too. But so I mean the question is like, do you feel more? Do you have a sort of natural habitat? Like, do you, do you like one style more than the other, or is it just you sort of where is it you feel more appropriate for a certain type of audience, or is it your mood? You know that you choose to use these different uh, techniques, let's say, or harmonic, um, and <clears throat> maybe um aleatoric you mentioned um sort of techniques as opposed to let's say the most uh tonal language is it i mean how do you choose your i you know i um I went, through a period, no, I went through a period that I was I would did the, the aleatoric and actually the aleatoric is very nice. It's it's a very uh, you feel you feel free a little bit. But the thing is that um, you know outside of the academic setting, university, it's it's not so easy to find performers to do it. So so really, I was limited by by my connection with performers and. So generally, the the more standard groups, standard orchestras or or ensembles and people, they they don't they're not they don't go into the uh, into the very modern things, or the so so in the last couple of you know sometimes for example the folk music when I said I, I have things for, based like you heard the 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 the, the, the bird song, and that's one example of using ethnic music. So, so I've used uh, ethnic music, and that's more that's tonal. And um, many works for orchestra, I do, I and I do tonally. I do, I write them for to tonally. Not, I don't know. But in the last couple of years, more more so than in the beginning. You know, the styles have changed. When I was um, when I was younger, the whole thing was. Uh, very abstract, atonal and chance music and Boulez and, and, and Stockhausen, John Cage and all that. And, uh, and since the late, late last 20 years, 30 years, that sort of, um, we don't hear about it so much. In the, in the 50s and 60s, it made a big impression. So, so when as, as a student and, and afterwards, so we felt we have to write something modern. We have to be modern, and uh, uh, but some of these works I tried to adapt to my own. How would I put it? My own aesthetic. I tried. I adapted them. I wasn't. It wasn't just a, a you know modern music for its own sake, and um, mm. so so that's all I can say. Oh, thank so, you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Right. <laughs> I give. Have you thought of in going from the Bible to the Siddur to Chafila and expressing your works within the um, that genre? Um, because again, Chafila is very expressive, just like the words of the Bible is expressive. And can it be contemporary or, or traditional or which way? This is a beautiful question because it leads to the last work I wanted to present. And the, the last work, I wanted to present is the prayer for Israel, for the state of Israel, 
where we're living now. And this is a prayer in the prayer book. In fact, it's the, the, the newest addition to the prayer book. It was written in the, in the late 1940s, early 50s. And, uh, and they put it into the prayer book. And now they say it in all the synagogues. Avinu Shabbat Shomayim, Suri Yisrael, the Golo, our Father, protect the land of Israel. And because last week was um, our Independence Day, I thought it would be an appropriate piece to summarize my presentation. And I just want to say that the performance, when we talk about non-Jewish performers, this was recorded in Cluj, uh, Romania by the Antiphonia Choir at the Gorge Dema Academy, where I was uh, in residence for a few, few weeks there. And they recorded this piece in Hebrew. So we're going to hear a non-Jewish choir singing the Tfilah, not just the prayer for Israel. And I guess that will be, we'll do, finish our presentation with that. Okay, Phil, can we hear it? Coming up. All right. It's an a cappella work.
si simply beautiful. Can I have your permission to introduce that to into our um, gala concert at our next convention? Absolutely. This is on, would, it's on you. It's on you. It's simple. But I, I would need the music, please, Max. I'll, I'll send, you, send me your address. I'll send it to you. Fantastic, because it's um, I, I, it's so moving and it's so different from other pieces of Avina Shabashamai that you know the Sol Zim one and the and the right. uh, Mayor Finkelstein. It's it's completely different. It's very spiritual, very moving, and it could be sung by Jew, Jewish, and non-Jewish um, choirs. So it, it wouldn't be a problem. No. It's the same. It's the same. Same thought. The same words mean mean the same thing. So um, I'd be very very grateful for that. It'd be lovely. I I know the the right choir to sing it as well. Wonderful. Wonderful. Send me, send me your, send me a mailing address. Okay, we'll do. And uh, yeah, we're we're having our next convention in Hungary in November. Wow. And it's not far from Israel. So if we do premiere it at um, our uh, concert, we would love you to be there. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Great. Beautiful. Ah. Okay. Are there any questions, any more questions before we uh, conclude this wonderful session? Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. So, um, can, may I ask Geraldine to say the last word? And, and on behalf of us, thank Max for a beautiful session. Um, let me just see if I'm muted or not. Um, no, can... It's been absolutely wonderful. And I, I think. Um, uh, Phil will also want to to say something, but Max, it's been really a pleasure to have you. And what we like about COS is that we can sit and relax, we can listen to music, we can talk about it, we can think about it, it can sink in, and we don't have to be rushed. So uh, it's been really lovely to to do that, and we hope we'll see you again soon. Um, and thank you, Alex, for uh, being with him. And over to you, Phil. Yeah, I'd just like to second what Geraldine said and what Alex said. Thank you both very much. It's been wonderful to learn more about your music, Max. Apologies for the technical glitches at the start there, but it was uh, it was lovely to be listening. Um, I wonder if I could just, we're all just handing over in this final section, but I wonder if I could hand over to Mark to tell us a bit about what we've got on next week. Sure. Again, my thanks to Max and Alex. Very, very moving. Um, our next session will be a presentation by myself, Dr. Jeff Janesco, and other members of our Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish uh, Experience staff at UCLA, as we share with you this wonderful project of a searchable oral history Jewish music database, something that we launched a number of months ago. It's a growing development, and we're really um, uh, excited to share it with you, a really unique resource in the development of Jewish music uh, research. Once again, many thanks to Alex and Max and hope to see you all again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you all.